Hello, and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Greer. This is Dr. Stephen Greer. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and uh, DisclosureProject.org. And for those of you that are just joining us for the first time, uh, welcome to the show. And we're going to have a really wonderful discussion today about uh, extraterrestrial contact and what it's like really to set up a contact team uh, where you live and kind of what's involved in that. And we have uh, a member of our uh, group who has a team in New York State, and uh, so she will be reviewing a lot of her experiences and her own team's experiences over the last the year or two since she got involved. And I'd like to thank the folks at the World Puja Network for uh, allowing us to be on the show every two weeks to bring you updates on the projects. And if you want to know more about what we're doing, you can go to cseti.org, uh, cseti.org, or disclosureproject.org and see uh, what we're doing related to uh, the Disclosure Project and also making contact with uh, interstellar civilizations. Um, the, the protocols that we're using, just as a sort of a quick overview, and um, but before, we'll be going over in just a moment. But before I get there, I'd just like to, to uh, introduce Marilyn. Uh, Marilyn came to us a couple years ago uh, and came to a training expedition we did on the Outer Banks of North Carolina and has been to other ones since then around the world and also to uh, last year in uh, Florida, or this year, I should say, earlier in, in Marco Island, and uh, lives in New York and uh, she is just a, a wonderful team member who's who's given this heart and soul. And uh, Marilyn, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here. So I, I think that one of the things that uh, people need to understand uh, before we get too much into how you've set your, up your group is that what it is that we actually do when we go out into the stars and, and make contact. And as, as you're, as you're going to find out in this discussion, sometimes we can't even go out. If, if the weather is so inclement, we do things inside. But this does not uh, preclude contact from happening in all kinds of mysterious ways. And uh, what most people uh, are amazed to find out uh, when they when they first begin hearing about what we're doing with contact with these interstellar civilizations that are visiting Earth is that the way in which they can reach out to us and that we can reach out to them is rooted in the uh, ancient knowledge of uh, consciousness that's in the Vedas and the science of consciousness and involves the interface between awareness and linear space-time and electromagnetism. And the protocols we use uh, involve that very expanded sort of universal paradigm of mind and consciousness and how mind and consciousness interface with three-dimensional space-time and reality. And this is because when you're looking into the civilizations that go faster than the speed of light, they are doing so by going through other dimensions. Some people call them dimensions or fields of reality. And you're not going to go from here to another star system at the speed of, say, the space shuttle. Uh, or, for example, we just launched uh, this uh, probe to Mars uh, this week that's going to uh, get there in about eight and a half months. That's just to Mars, which is, of course, the closest planet to us. And, and therefore, the question becomes, uh, how do you go from one star system to another? Well, it certainly isn't with a rocket or a jet. Um, and it certainly isn't with uh, even an ion pulsed engine or anything like that that's been proposed in, in conventional uh, sciences of the 20th century. Uh, you're going to be doing it through very high voltage electromagnetic systems that allow the spacecraft and its occupants to resonantly shift out of linear space time uh, and three dimensional space time into another dimension and then appear at another point in space. And so literally you're bypassing linearity. So instead of going from point A to B, you find that there are dimensions that are more intimately uh, related to all points in the universe. And this gets into the whole science of trans-dimensional reality. Now the ultimate uh, connecting point in all of this is consciousness, pure consciousness. And everyone on this program, since it's the World Puja Network, understands the power of the collective mind, but also individual awareness when it merges into the ocean of unbounded mind and universal consciousness. And 
the entire cosmos is a conscious hologram that every star, every atom, every photon is fluxing in and out of a multipotent sea of not only energy, but also awareness. And that between pure consciousness and linear space-time are an almost infinite number of gradations or dimensions. It's sort of like if you were going to be looking at uh, the analogy I often use, although it's a very crude one, is that if you had an old-fashioned radio where you have to turn the dial and you're shifting from one channel to another channel to another channel, but you can go up and down the uh, FM dial and sometimes you could pick up a station uh, and then another station and sometimes multiple stations. And you could hear three or four radio programs kind of going on in the background at the same time. Well, in a similar way, there are dimensions folded within any volume of space-time. And, in fact, there are an infinite number of degrees. It's like how many numbers are there between one and infinity? Well, that's how many gradations in resonant fields potentially exist in any volume of space. And the finest level of that is pure consciousness, where it is omnipresent, where when you meditate, you go into a state where you can experience non-locality, where you can be in a place of the placeless, as it's been called by the mystics. And in that meditative state, you can then be at any point in space and time. Well, that's on the level of consciousness and then thought, but it also can happen that way on the level of technology and, and science, where sciences that are very high voltage systems allow a material spacecraft and people with physical bodies, although they may not be human, can drop, can resonantly shift, become not bound to linear space-time, go into another dimension, and therefore the quote-unquote travel time between uh, another galaxy in here, instead of being millions of light years, might in fact be a few seconds or a few days. And the physics of this are, are really, quite, really, really fascinating, but it informs the protocols we're using, which involve using the conscious mind to go into a deep meditative state, and we use a mantra for this, and then experiencing the state of quiet, pure mind, and then within that quiet space, begin to remote view and see uh, other planets, other uh, peoples, other spacecraft, and where they may be. And then once one gets a sense of non-locality, that one has expanded into this ocean of quiet mind and can function within that state, you then kind of turn it around to a active vectoring, where if you see, for example, a spacecraft out in our solar system, you might connect to the occupants and then show them that you're in New York and or out in upstate New York or someplace uh, in, out in the countryside, and you would show them our planet and you would show them where you are, zooming in like you would on Google Earth, uh, right all the way to where you're located, and invite them there in a spirit of universal peace uh, that's based in this concept of universal awareness. And so we call this the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind initiative, where humans make contact with these other civilizations uh, for the purpose of expanding uh, our relationship uh, to the interplanetary level. And so the, the really central operating system, if you want to look at it from a computer point of view, is the, this universal mind. And from that, the protocols flow. And this is why people who understand higher states of consciousness and other dimensions really make very excellent ambassadors to these interstellar civilizations because their reality is that for them to travel and communicate across the vastness of space, they have to understand this concept and this paradigm. They have to have gone beyond the sort of Newtonian, reductionist, linear uh, 3D paradigm in order to go from a, a distant star system or galaxy to Earth. Now, as you go to disclosureproject.org, you'll see that there's abundant evidence uh, that we are being visited. But, but you then have to ask the question, if they're here, 
how did they get here? What is the operating paradigm? And you quickly come into this realization that the knowledge that's in the ancient Vedas and in the ancient the teachings of, in the traditions all over the world, the shamans, the Native Americans, uh, in every tradition of this, this aspect of awareness that is universal and infinite and omnipresent is very key to this because the communication systems that they have, and, and granted, they are material communication systems that are very high-tech electronics, they interface with directed and coherent thought as clearly as you and I would connect with a telephone or a cell phone. Now, we're using, of course, electromagnetic signals that are limited to the speed of light when we use our, our telephones. But we're talking about civilizations that are thousands or, in many cases, millions of years more developed than we are technologically right now on Earth. And what that means is that we have got to understand that new paradigm of conscious quantum reality in order to be ambassadors to these civilizations because it informs our protocol for contact, but it also informs the kind of experiences we can have, which to some people might seem rather bizarre. For example, stepping outside of the Hollywood movie set for a moment, when an actual extraterrestrial civilization makes contact, it may be that they would choose for security reasons not to actually fully materialize in this dimension. They may do something through an electronic system. They may do something through an electronic uh, magnetic field detector like we take out into the field. They may uh, actually appear as a, a sort of a plasma-like spherical ball or an energy field in the room where you're sitting. Um, and there could then be communication that would be telepathic or, or there could be psychokinesis. There could be all kinds of things that would be attributed to uh, what are called the Vedic cities, S-I-D-D-H-I-S, the, the powers and abilities of the ancient Vedic knowledge, uh, including levitation, dematerialization, teleportation, bilocation, trilocation, quadrilocation, where you appear in multiple places at the same time. Uh, on and on and on and on. Uh, and, and the reason for that is because the experiences of people who have been in these enlightened states of consciousness is that they have actually begun to journey into these dimensions which interstellar civilizations must have perfected in order to get here. They cannot get here using a shuttle, space shuttle, or a rocket, or something that is going slower than the speed of light. And so I've written a great deal in the books that I've, I've put out about the crossing point of light, that when you reach this point where you cross into this uh, whole aspect of the universe, some would say a multiverse, where you have uh, energy fields and realities, you're in a, 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 a very deep uh, state of reality that's beyond the speed of light, and you find yourself suddenly in, in getting into experiences that are very similar to, for example, an astral uh, lucid flying dream. And almost everyone's had a dream where they've uh, found themselves flying over some place or had a precognitive dream. Well, this so-called astral energy field of the body of light is another dimension, uh, even though it's folded within our physical body. So there's no separation in space. You have to not think in a, in a linear way. And this is why these extraterrestrial civilizations can pop into our reality and be manifested in, in ways that can go everything from a fully materialized spacecraft, which we've had overhead and, and we have images of, to choosing, for whatever reasons, to be present in energy fields that are more subtle all the way into and including thought. And, and for those of you who understand the power of sound and the mantras into tonality, we have been out under the stars before or in a room having a, a session where a perfectly beautiful chime, like a almost celestial tone comes out of thin air. And people sitting in the circle with us will see in their mind's eye the form of a spacecraft, a spherical spacecraft that will float through the field, and you can actually see it. But, you, but with, the, with the physical eyes, you don't see anything. You just hear. And again, this gets into the Vedic concept of name and form, where tonality manifests form and light, not the other way around.
And so this is a really exciting sort of exploration where we're bringing together the science of consciousness in the ancient Vedas with the space age and this whole new area of science. And that's what we're putting into practice, actually, out under the stars uh, when we make contact and go and make contact together. And so we also use um, uh, some high-powered lasers, which we send out into space. We have one that goes about two or 300 miles into space. And then we have um, also some electronic beeping tones that were recorded in the crop circles that we got from Colin Andrews that we uh, send out over uh, radio signals just in case our mind, when we're trying to show them where we are, isn't as clear and they need a specific linear vector of exactly where we are. We use the lasers and the tone. So those three things, light, tone, and thought, are the core of uh, the protocols we use, but it's done within the concept of our viewing ourselves as ambassadors of peace from Earth to these civilizations. So what we have concluded is that they really are eager to have people reach out and make contact like this. And they give us a great deal of information, even about their worlds. We recently got a question from someone listening to the World Puja Network. Well, you know, well, why don't they give you what well, they do? We'll have images in our minds where they will be sending to us what their planets look like, what their people look like, what their houses and architecture look like. Um, and even what their culture and and uh, and life is like back on their home planets. We recently have had a number of people in our teams who have had amazing experiences with this, and so there is a sort of cultural exchange going on on a very profound level. And within that, there can be all these different manifestations and phenomena that are electronic, tonality, uh, objects that appear, orbs that float through the room or the field, uh, all kinds of amazing experiences. And so in training people to do this, of course, we, we bring people out under the stars. I, well, I've been trying to do this four or five times a year where we set up a week, and, and we're going to be going to... Uh, Marco Island, Florida in April, and we're going to go to a site where we have a beach that last year we had really an entire three and a half hour uh, emergence, I call it, trans-dimensional objects that were on the beach and over the ocean and over the lagoon in front of us for three and a half hours. That was just astonishing um, in terms of what was being seen, but what was in the other dimensions was even more profound. And uh, so at the same time, we're having electronic communication through magnetometers and uh, radar detectors and things like this uh, going off. There are all these other phenomena. And then on the conscious level of remote viewing within our awareness, there are conversations and images and uh, information being downloaded. So all of this is going on very dynamically, and we take a week uh, to go out together to train people for this so that they can then go back home. Uh, and uh, this recent expedition we had in, in California, for example, we had people from Germany and from England and from Malaysia and from all over the world who then go home and do what Maryland's been doing there in New York. So with that little introduction, sort of quick overview, um, uh, I'd like for, for Marilyn, for you to kind of share sort of how you got involved and also the experiences you've been having there in New York with your own local contact team. Well, Stephen, I never tire of hearing your overview of this. It's, I never heard anybody <laughs> describe it like you can describe it, and, and it's thank you. Um, I came to the Outer Banks in, 19, in 2009, and it was an incredible experience, and I came back home, and there happened to be three of us from New York, Diane and I and Eric, who had attended that, and so we started, because once you have this kind of shift in consciousness, and your whole worldview is just remarkably changed, and yes. so it, it's a very lonely experience to come back, and so we decided we had to get together, the three of us, and we went out into on top of a mountain, and we started doing our own CSETI at night, and we had extraordinary experiences, and so we said, well, it is possible to have these experiences without Dr. Greer. Oh, yes. Because, of course, we followed the protocol, and, and it, it, this consciousness and contact is intertwined and and is is the truth, and so we started doing that. And then, as more people had gone to see SETI ambassador trainings with you, there were more people in the area. Now we have such an incredible cohesive group, 
And people, you know, Stephen, the thing that's so amazing about gathering this group, and we all need it for support because we're all going through these amazing changes. And so gathering in such a safe environment with other like-minded people becomes paramount. And we have people from all walks of life. We have people in the legal profession. We have a guy that works for the sanitation department in New York City. We have um, a psychologist, which I am, and a social worker, and a massage therapist, and a nurse, and an attorney. I mean, it, it, it's it, and an entertainer from New York, and farmers, and it's just marvelous it's how awesome. Yeah. The one thing we have in common is this commitment to holding a space, and sometimes we hold the space for hours to expand the spiral of conscious cohesiveness in the group. And as we've met. Over the months, our group has gotten so incredible, and some of the experiences have just been marvelous. I want to share one, actually, that happened recently. Oh, but as good. one member of our group put it, it feels like we are developing our own signature energy for the ETs. That's right. And we do. It really is quite extraordinary. So we gathered. There, there's global CSETIs all throughout the world once a month where everybody on the planet who has a local CSETI, we all go out the same night, Saturday night, with the new moon. And on October 29th was one, and so our group gathered, even though there was a snowstorm in October (laughs) on that day. So what we decided is everybody was going to come up and stay for the night so they wouldn't have to worry about the snow. So people came, and we gathered. There were six of us amazingly enough, in the storm, and we were in the dining room to start the evening just chatting together, and a flash came through the window, and two of our members saw this flash, and we immediately said, okay, it's time to go up to the meditation room. Well, we went up, and we were listening to the crop circle tones, actually, and all of us just kind of went right into a meditation, and after the meditation, three three of us had this same exact event happen where we saw the ETs entering the room and giving us a gift of some kind. And each of us saw ETs behind us and in front of us giving us these gifts. And each one had a slightly different twist on that. But three out of six had the same meditation. And wow. all of us were visualizing there were fairy ETs. And uh, one, one of our members constantly works with this jellyfish ET. <laughs> And we saw a lot of orbs coming in the room. And the thing that was so exciting about this, Stephen, is people often think, well, we have to go out and sit under the stars. But this was all done inside. We couldn't go out and sit outside. And inside, we started seeing white, green, and purple orbs. And we started seeing flashes outside. And all this whole time we were in the meditation room, the tri-field electromagnetic meter was going off pretty much the whole time, and we'd never had it go off inside like that before. So we took a break, and when we came back from break, we went up to the this yoga loft we have and expanded our meditation, and we were holding hands um, for the meditation, and little did any of us know that we were holding hands in a circle for two and a half hours. And we thought when we came out of this meditation, we thought we had only been there for 30 minutes Wow! and during that time the temperature changed there was energy fluxing in and out of the room from the windows like I have never seen amazing like electrical beautiful fluorescent colors were right in the room at one point I had visualized a remote view to a, a spacecraft that was right on top almost of our roof of the house and it was this incredible craft that came down. And at that time, people started feeling vibrations in the floor. The floor to some felt moving. People began getting touched. Um, And finally, there was a flash outside, right outside. We were on the second floor in this yoga loft, and right outside, coming from the ground, was this incredible blue-green, huge flash. And it happened three times. And... At the third time, a couple of our members saw at the corner of the window a circle of red, blue, yellow, and green light in the yard, and then a flash emanated out of that. And at that that third time when that flash came, 
we lost power in the entire house. And wow. that power went off for two hours. And the next day, we all went outside to see if there were lines down or transformers, nothing. Nothing had happened. There were no lines down. The transformers were fine. But we had just simply lost power when that last incredible burst of energy came from the ground in the front yard, not far from where this room was. And that, awesome. that was just awesome. So at that point, the power was off. We decided to all go to bed, and one of our members was sleeping downstairs, and she went to sleep, but she was hearing taps on the window, and she kind of pulled her blanket up over her head and said, all right. And at some point, she saw a green being beckoning her outside, and the next thing she knows, she was on a craft, and she spent the night on the craft. And, Stephen, the next day when she came up, I said, I hope it wasn't too hot down there for you. I hope the temperature was okay. And she said, I don't think it really mattered because I wasn't there most of the night. And she came upstairs in her pant legs. Now, mind you, there's snow on the ground outside. Her pant legs are wet with dirt on them, and she had just taken clean sweats out of her knapsack and put them on before bed, right. and they were all wet, no place else in her body, just her pant legs where they would have been in the snow. Right, right. So that was an incredible experience that night. And, you know, I think the remarkable thing is that it was indoors. They made themselves known through our tri-field electromagnetic meter. They made themselves known through the electricity by the power going out. Several people had cameras. The batteries didn't work. Um, that is one place they come in, and we saw these beautiful light flashes that the, this crap must have been, I would say, no further than 100 feet above the house. Right, right. Right, I'm sure. And 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 the thing of, uh, is that people, when they hear these stories, they understand the light that you see is so celestial and beautiful. It's not like when you see a helicopter or a light from a oh, no. car or something. These oh, lights no. are, have a brilliance and a purity to them where you can tell that it's 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 literally coming from another dimension. It's so and true. We were all just sure. so affected, yes. I think we were affected, the, the, the light, We all of us still can't, Stop talking about how that light affected us. And, and the light see, does, and actually the light is conscious. And so what you have to understand about uh, really advanced civilizations, um, the ones that are at the level of cosmic awareness and God consciousness, those civilizations, even though they have physical worlds like Earth and bodies like we have, their, even their technologies are a reflection of their level of consciousness. So... And that is true. That if you look at any civilization, the level of technology they have is a is a reflection of the uh, collective level of attained consciousness. So when an entire planet attains, for example, enlightenment, which is where Earth and humanity is headed, and we attain that state, even our sciences and technologies reflect that level of knowing and consciousness, even at the level of what would appear to be just scientific and material, quote-unquote, sciences, but they're actually emanating from that level of intelligence and knowledge and enlightenment. And you feel that and know it when you see these, and it's very, very unmistakable. It's very different than seeing a, you know, a Boeing 747 or something. And, um, and so, which is a reflection of, you know, you know, sort of early, mid 20th century technology. You know, I remind people jet engines and things are from the 30s, um, and cars are from the late 1800s, the internal combustion engine and, and rocket are from 1942 or so, and all the other really advanced sciences and technologies are, have been stolen, basically, and are classified. But when you have these encounters, the ET civilizations that are interstellar and going beyond the speed of light into these other dimensions, but then can emerge into this dimension, what you see, even if they're not fully materialized, even these evidences of them, the light, the tonality, everything is so pure, it's so beautiful, and it's very much uh, in uh, coherence with their level of consciousness, and that's why it's so affecting. Well, you know, and, and it, you know, you can always feel the difference when the tones come or the lights come, because it, it's so heartfelt. 
Yes. It's like it's and it's consciousness felt. And if you don't experience that, it, that's probably a funny way to describe it. But it, it, you feel it in your consciousness and you feel it in your heart. Absolutely, it's beautiful, really. And and the 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 heart is the feeling part of this is very key because it, you know our entire bodies are very advanced electromagnetic conscious receivers and i mean we have these other technologies we have out there but in reality uh, the the best instrument there is in the entire cosmos is uh you know the the conscious intelligent beings that inhabit the cosmos uh and our our chakras and our minds and our bodies and the bioelectric field of our bodies and where that interfaces with thought and consciousness and feeling and heart and spirit these are all uh, all at play and all in use when we're making contact and yeah. so it's not like it's just some like you're in a laboratory looking measuring you know an electromagnetic potential um although certainly we have devices that do measure electromagnetic potential and for those of you who haven't heard this program before the, this meter she's talking about measures the magnetic field flux uh, or change and so you know the earth has a magnetic field and these meters like if you take it up to a car engine or a motor will will make a very loud squeal um, because of the magnetic field that electromagnetic motors make. But we can be in areas where you know we set it to zero so that the background is at zero. And then when these ET vehicles and uh, per- beings and uh, their presence begins to come into this dimension, they actually set these meters off. And often in a way where they begin to go into the circuitry of the electronics of our meters and are talking, where they're actually providing information. And the last book, um, the last chapter of the, of the book that came out um, a couple years ago that's called uh, Contact, Countdown to Transformation, um, which is at DisclosureProject.org. You can get it there. And it has a DVD with it that has some of the tones that we've recorded, but also the translation that I experienced when we had contact from um, these ETs from the Orion sector of space that made contact with us uh, over the last couple of years in, in the Joshua Tree National Park when we were out there. And this kind of contact is very specific because these detectors make a, a sort of a tonality and it's almost like there's an emotional quality to some of them where they're actually speaking and they're using these electronics um, and coming into the circuitry of the electronics while there's all these other amazing phenomenon going on such as these uh, you know lights and, and bursts of light and circles of light that appear and then on the level of consciousness the remote viewing of the mind you know those I tell people these sort of phenomena are just really like indicators of what's really going on on the conscious right. level and that on the internal level of remote viewing and in the meditative state there's this entire richness where you see the actual beings and their craft and their worlds and conversations occur and all of that and that's one of the things we train people to do is to set up the entire range of experience that goes from, you know, whether it's a fully materialized craft or object to the ability to go into deep, silent, meditative states and then remote view and communicate with these civilizations using consciousness and thought. And um, in that sense, I mean, truly cosmic ambassadors. Uh, and, and, and this is a growing experience for everyone. And I'm very interested. Uh, what, how, what, what of the experience, uh, your, your colleague uh, who had the wet pants, who, um, you know, uh, the, the base of her pants that got wet from being in the snow that um, heard the tapping on the window. Uh, did she remember much else about what happened that night? Well, it, yes. She was on a craft with several different kinds of ET. She remembers... Yes actually fish beings and green ETs especially right. um, and and she is pretty new to this whole process so she was like I, I think it sounds pretty silly to say there are fish ETs but of course there are and she was on this craft with a variety and she was just really felt like she was downloaded with tremendous amounts of information which comes keeps coming through her dreams now okay. so and yeah. that's that's how it happens. One of the things is that when you're having an experience, you might be out for an evening, 
and there will be an experience, but the knowledge is in the level of the what I call the uh, – uh, I'm sure everyone on this program understands what Ritambara Pragya is, or, or if you don't, I'll explain it. Um, the level of consciousness that's just this side, as it were, of the plane of the absolute unbounded mind, in that most subtle field of consciousness, there's a level – where all knowledge is contained. It's like, it's like the door of knowledge or the book of knowledge. But it's actually encoded within every single human being's awareness. And this is the wellspring of science and art and invention and inspiration where people say, I don't know how I knew that. It just came. Right. Because within, right. within every person who is conscious and awake, which is all of us, is the totality of the unboundedness of the being. And that means that we can access that knowledge. But what happens in contact when it's on this deep level, the ETs can communicate. And it doesn't have to be in a language. It can be in, with this very elemental level of communication where it's like a packet of knowingness. It's like a yeah. packet of not, And that kind of un- unfolds into conscious mind and into our understanding of intellect and language. And it may be months. It may take years for it to unfold or it may yeah. unfold more quickly. And this is another aspect of contact that is, is just beautiful. Well, it's funny because the night before this group met this last time, I was wide awake in the, in the, in the night and all of a sudden I heard this beautiful cricket sounds. Yeah. And, but they were not like earthquake crickets and I knew very quickly that this was an incredible sound coming in from the ETs. And my ears got incredibly heavy with this cricket sound that went on and on and on and then I began to slowly discern the information that was held in this cricket sound and some of the information was about our what was going to happen in our local C SETI group the next day and but it comes in, in in different packets of energy. Sound being one of them. Right. Right. Exactly. And the sound component of thought is what a mantra is, by the way. And this is why if you go to every culture, you find there's this very important connection between chanting or singing or drumming, music, mantras, in terms of it activating and allowing the mind to to settle into a state that's very, very deep consciousness that goes beyond just one's individual self into this great self, into this bounded aspect. And uh, many uh, traditions have elements of this. But it's also true that when contact is happening, we have these experiences where there's, you know, we have been in rooms where I've been given a a talk at a training with a, when we're on these expeditions. In fact, this happened recently in California where everyone in the room suddenly hears this beautiful tone that comes in and it happens at a certain point when we're having a deep discussion about something very spiritual or very important um, and that's how they, they're they affirming it or contacting. But within that tone, frequently there is this uh, knowledge within the tone. But it's yeah. not language like, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, right. J, K, L, M, N, O, P. You know, so all of this gets into really advanced concepts of of communication. For example, you know, I can say the word apple, and everyone knows the word in English, apple. But you can see in your mind, visualize a red, delicious apple. Well, that's then you've created it in the astral, mental visualization. But within the red, delicious apple is a tonality that transcends its form, that manifests the form. And then within that tonality, it's connected to sort of a primal tone that's the emanation of all knowledge. And so this is why... Every blade of grass is a doorway into the knowledge of all things and why you can experience on a, a contact where the communication comes into these packets. And within that packet might be an enormous amount of specific information and it unfolds later uh, in meditation or in lucid dreams or uh, just comes to you as sort of a remembrance because that's the nature of non-locality and consciousness and communication. And this is what's so exciting is that this is how I first experienced um, contact uh, when I was uh, when I was 18 and I went on board 
this craft that, that that took me out into space, and we created these protocols together, these extraterrestrial people and myself. And I was this young boy, and six months earlier, I'd had a near-death experience that opened me up to the reality of conscious existence. And before that, you know, I was raised, my family were very devout atheists and didn't believe in anything. And <laughs> I would say they were fanatical agnostic atheists and nothing could possibly exist if it wasn't in a test tube. But what I found was that the whole conscious universe was folded within us and that you can experience that. And so I started practicing meditation. Then I learned a mantra meditation and I was sitting up on this mountain and I had this experience. And a lot of people have asked me, and I understand why they ask me this, but they'll say, oh, what did y'all talk about? I go, no, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like, you know, gee, let's talk about, you know, that, you know, I went to the store today and bought some really, you know, great Mejdul dates and they were delicious. I mean, it wasn't like that. It was, <laughs> it was very much where we were together in this state of pure consciousness, and the communication and the contact was all on. It, it, it sounds abstract, but it's actually very profound of oneness and conveyance that was in a form that was pre-verbal, beyond verbal, beyond linear, and. That is exactly uh, how many people experience this. Now, other people will get very specific images and very specific uh, words, and people say, well, do the ETs know English? I'm going, well, the thing is you have to understand that conscious mind, and all of us are in this state of oneness, whether we acknowledge it or not, that is the universal translator. Mind itself is the uber cosmic translator. So it doesn't matter what the la originating language is or the person who's receiving it is in, it's going through the field of conscious intelligence and that provides a translation into your own language. It's amazing. Yes. Okay, well, some... that, I don't know if we're getting into too deep, but this is really how it happens in terms of just getting, sharing the truth of it. And, and that's why these experiences, I'm so thrilled to hear, you know, of these experiences people having all over the world. It's so gratifying to me. Well, I'll tell you, Stephen, when you, when you begin to listen to what you're talking about, it, it is much easier to understand things like remote viewing. Right. And, and just to add on to, to what happened to our group that night, one of the members was home in Albany, couldn't make it. So we said to her, we called exactly when we started. She went into meditation, and I said, write everything down. Well, later the, ne the next day, we checked with her to see what she wrote down, and we already knew what happened in our group. Well, she remote viewed the exact room we were in, and we always have a choice of two rooms. She knew which room we started in. She saw it. She saw the craft over the house. Right. She saw the, the um, what else did she see? Oh, she ha had the same vision of the ETs coming into that room, standing with each by each one of us and giving us something, which was, so that was four of us that had the exact, and she wasn't even there. And right. that was all through remote viewing, and she's pretty new to this, and it's amazing. Yeah, that is. That is. And, and this is what I tell people. You know, a lot of people go, oh, well, you know, I've really never practiced meditation, uh, or I practice it, but I've never had any experiences. You know, we had a medical doctor recently who is a Stanford-trained physician who came um, just this, the Crestone to his first week event in Colorado in July, or was it June? It was June. And, you know... But he had this amazing breakthrough experience that was the most extraordinary, very extraordinary meditation experience of his whole life. Um, and he'd been on, you know, many, many meditation retreats. But the combination of the coherence of the group and the protocols that, that we're teaching that involve the specific tonality of this three-part mantra with, and of course, we always do a puja. We do a puja. Uh, try to do one each night now when we go out on these expeditions. Since we're on the World Puja Network, I wouldn't talk about this. I was on some of the New York Times but um, because they wouldn't understand what a Puja is, but everyone on this show understands that. And we do a sacred Puja, and we sit in meditation, and then there's this group coherence where, you know, I'll lead the meditation, but it's the group coherence, and the whole is greater than the sum of the parts because when yes. you have all these people yes. experiencing that state of consciousness together – 
there is a power created and there is a coherence created that is actually not just arithmetically additive, but is exponential. Well, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. When that absolutely, happens. absolutely, and and you know, Dr. John at Princeton, when he had the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab, the Peer Lab, you know, he and I talked about this, and he said, well, what you're doing out under the stars is what I've been doing in the laboratory, where he would take people and have them, you know, put their intent on a random number generator or a robot, and it would right. have an effect. But he found that if there were two people who loved each other or who were coherent, the effect wasn't just additive, it was exponential. And so there is the power of a group doing this together who are coherent. Now, of course, dealing with the human condition, finding a coherent group is always right. a challenge because, you know, right. we all have our individualities and our egos. Right, right, have right. You. Well, yes. And, but, and, you know, but I'll tell you. It, 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 if you do the meditation together, it kind of smooths out the rough edges. And the main thing is to look for people who are doing this contact together who have the intent. And if the intent and the purpose is what unites everyone. Oh, it, and it's so true. And in our group, even here, I mean, it's, it's, it is that coherence that we are building. So, and it's taken us many, many months to build this. Sure. And and but but when we meet and we have this, the 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 experiences not only are intensifying, Stephen, but we're having more and more similar experiences. We're seeing similar colors. We're having similar meditations. We're hearing similar sounds. I mean, and more and more um, experiences. And it, and it is truly now a group experience. Yes, everybody in the group still has their individual meditations and visions and remote views, but more and more we're having, we're finding there's a whole new group experience. And as far as I'm concerned, this is the prototype. The way we've worked on this group and the way your ambassador trainings go is the prototype for what all groups can be on this planet. Absolutely, you're right, and and that's and it creates this uh, wonderful experience, very joyful and blissful actually. And um, and then w once there is that level of coherence, a lot of people think that oh, I'm going to come to a workshop where they sit back passively, and they don't realize no, they're plugging into this universal field together, and they're making the contact together, and they're manifesting that reality together. And that is a very very different paradigm than from say someone who's viewing it. You know, you're going to go to a workshop and do your own thing and that well, and, 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 and it's a process to get your mindset adjusted to to that but it's very important because the extraterrestrial civilizations function in teams that are highly highly coherent uh, and they are looking for people individually but collectively who are in that state of coherence because what we have to do is go from people having sort of anecdotal one-on-one -on -one experiences with seeing a UFO or a contact experience to teams of people and that setting up the morphogenic field, the hundredth monkey effect as it were, for the entire globe of Earth, all of Earth all of humanity to have that experience. And that is where we're headed because we're headed into a future of enlightenment and interplanetary civilization. And so where does that start? It doesn't just happen by w waving a magic wand. We're actually all part of the, uh, like the cells of an organism, of a body that is conscious and living together. We're all creating that reality. And that's why these contact teams are so important all over the world that are doing this. And people who want to join, by the way, if you have an iPhone or an iPad, there's a, an app uh, at, the, at the Apple Store, uh, the C-SETI Contact app, where all these protocols and the meditation and everything's on there. And they're also at DisclosureProject.org. There's a place there where you can order a whole training kit to set up a contact team wherever you live. And because um, not everyone can take a week off and go out into the desert or wherever, um, or Marco Island, or, but if you can do one of these week-long expeditions, I think it's valuable for folks to do it. And I want to say that, that, that I think one thing I've learned both from the ambassador trainings and our local FICETI group is that this isn't just about contacting ETs, that when we sit together and we're in this cohesive consciousness together, and part of what our group feels is this unconditional, most remarkable love for each right. other right. and peace for each other. And so it, it's about 
both having the motivation to contact ETs and learning about the science of consciousness in such a way that our group evolves into that coherent consciousness. And that's where we have to be as a human race, in my mind, is understanding that this is where we have to evolve to. Yes, it, it, it is... It is how also to contact ETs, but I think the ETs are incredible in helping us, and you design the protocol of understanding how when we raise this consciousness, we do have contact. That's the key, and they're intertwined. However, we need to be doing the science of consciousness work, both as individuals and in groups on Earth anyway. Right. and. As we do that, we will be probably more accepted into the star brotherhood and sisterhood <laughs> because sure. we will become a peaceful planet. Right, and that's the, the entry. You know, people always ask me, well, you know, why isn't there more open contact? You know, I remember Larry King on CNN, uh, the, the Larry King live show. I said, well, why don't they just land on the White House lawn and get it over with? I'm going, well, you know, maybe the consciousness isn't there. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, and, and maybe, you know, what has to happen is that there has to be evidence that we are a peaceful civilization. Exactly. Uh, for that kind of more. And so the, the entry ticket to this kind of, of more and increasing levels of open contact is a peaceful global civilization. And also where we not only re are going to live peacefully on this planet, but also vow to go out into space peacefully. It's not enough to say, oh, well, we're going to unite the Earth and be peaceful here, but we're going to set up war with this ET race or that ET race out in space. That whole Star Wars mentality has got to be put to bed, and that is really key because one of the key things to being part of these contact teams is to be truly a, an ambassador to the universe, and we do this without prejudice. And without the concept that there's going to be this idea that, well, you know, we want to have contact with this civilization, but not that civilization. And, you know, we like the ones that are this shape and color and type and mythology that's associated with them. And we don't like the ones of this shape and size and color of that mythology. In other words, what we don't want to do is do an anthropocentric projection exactly. of, of the kind of dysfunction and nonsense that's gotten us into the situation. Situation we're here today where you know every race and every creed and every religion is warring and blowing each other up uh, and and then begin to uh, replicate that dysfunctional paradigm in space right uh, which is you know unfortunately if you go to a, a UFO conference what I the reason I'm always depressed when I go to one of those even though I'm often a keynote speaker is that so much of the stuff it's just so atavistic and, uh, uh, you know, very in a, in a, not in a good way, but in a, a sort of Stone Age uh, mentality of us versus them. And, you know, you know, I, I get a, you know, occasionally interviewed by a documentary and they talk about the alien invasion and agenda. And I'm going, oh, my God, you know, but so much of that, I always I always talk about the cosmic mirror, the way people view these civilizations and visitors, I think, is a mirror of themselves. And I think well, that... Even we call that in psychology a reaction formation. That no, was not like no. that yourself you give to others. That's exactly. That's exactly what that is. It sure is. It is a rea it's a classic reaction formation. And, and that's and, why these, these trainings and the, the establishing, you know, being ambassadors and, and gathering together as ambassadors... That, that is changing the world because we gather together only with that peace, only with that love, and only with that understanding of consciousness. And like you said, that will change the morphogenic field of this planet. And that's the future of the planet. And it's not only – once that is understood and we vow to live that way, then everything is possible. I mean, when I say everything – it's all right there, ready to come out. Uh, you know, and Disclosure Project has worked on bringing out the evidence that we're being visited. See, SETI is doing the work that is this contact and, and having teams, contact teams all over the world. And then the Orion Project dot org has been working on uh, educating people about the energy and propulsion systems and the new sciences and technologies that are transdimensional, and all. 
all of this has to be coming into fruition uh, in, in a, in, within the context of a peaceful paradigm because the technologies can't be brought out and then been bent to the purpose of war. They have to be brought out and put to the purpose of peace, healing the earth, uh, creating abundance, uh, being sure that everyone on earth is cared for so that they can be educated and grow into higher states of consciousness. And we can that, have That's the vision. And 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 I also want to say, Stephen, that with we always get together and we talk about what's happened in between times. And on and you know slowly, slowly, even in in the last two years, I've seen things begin to accelerate in terms of everyday people's consciousness. Eric was driving out to our sea study night on Saturday. He went through a small town because we live out in the boonies. He went through a small town that's notorious for picking up people for speeding. Sure enough, a cop stops him, (laughs) and he the the cop says, "I need to know where you're going." And he says, "I'm going out to an ambassador's C study local C study night to contact ETs." And the cop says, "What the heck are ETs?" And he goes, "We're contacting extraterrestrials." And the cop goes, "Oh wow, that's really cool." He goes (laughs) back. He goes back to his car to get to write out the ticket. He comes back and he says, "I'm not going to give you a ticket." And Eric it. got isn't that, so even you know it 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 it's just we all laugh because it, I think it's a, a litmus test of of slowly but surely <laughs> people are more open. Oh, very much so, and it's so wonderful. I was going to LAX airport uh, last month and. And um, coming back from this, these meetings in, in Hollywood and L.A. and, and um, the desert with our team, and um, I, I had gotten through um, TSA, and there was a whole group of, of um, young, uh, like college-age guys, a group of three or four, and I started hearing my name called, <laughs> and they started chasing me down the concourse. Oh, we just love this, and we're doing it also, and you don't know who we are. And so what, it's exciting because what we're finding is that people from all over the world are beginning to not only acknowledge that we're not alone, but they're beginning to do something about it. And a lot of people say, oh, my God, you know, they get into these conspiracy theories. They say, what can we do? I say, oh, there's so much you can do because everyone can do exactly what you're doing. And you identify some people of like mind. They understand the concepts in consciousness, practice them, intend to make contact for peaceful purposes, and then the things that unfold are just astonishing and beautiful. And and that's happening. And the more that happens, the more it'll turn the entire state of the world in that direction, which is well, you know, morphogenic the, fields propagate. Well, you somebody said, a member said, a CSETI member said, Stephen is the roots and the trunk of the tree. And all of us are the branches. And the more we go out and establish these local groups, we become a branch, a tree that's so full of branches that the branches then have their own seeds. And, and I think once the government gets that this is already producing a forest of trees, right. that perhaps you'll be safer and, and perhaps we'll all be safer. Yes, and that's and- why it's imperative for people to become ambassadors. It is, and there's so much people can do to, to learn about it and, and be part of it. And, you know, I mean, like, we've tried to make it as accessible as we possibly can, even to folks who can't come out for a week with us. And you can find out all about that at CSETI.org and also DisclosureProject.org. And um, it's just an exciting process. And I really want to thank you, Marilyn, for, for helping spearhead and, and with Diane and the people there uh, in New York, because, you know, to have a group that meets on a regular basis and does this and grows in coherence um, creates its own local morphogenic field, as it were. And that coherence builds, and that's why your contact experiences are going to get more and more amazing, um, both uh, individually but collectively. And that that's a real... Uh, a process that that once it gets established creates its uh, own power and uh, that's why doing this with a few people who can be coherent and functional and 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 loving and enjoy each other's company is so one uh, such a great experience for people to have and well Stephen you know I want to say to you you've taught us how to be ambassadors not only to the ETs but to be ambassadors and ushering in this incredible time and this new shift and actually this new hope for Earth. So I can't thank you enough. Oh, well, you're welcome. 
Well, I think we've uh, run out of time. I can't believe it's been an hour already. It seems like it's been 15 minutes. We had a time warp. <laughs> well, I hope this has been informative for everyone, and thank you for uh, being with me today on the show, Marilyn. And, uh, You're welcome. Say hi to all the dear people there in New York and to everyone at the World Puja Network. Uh, thank you for hosting us here, and I hope to see some of you uh, soon at one of these expeditions under the stars. Um, uh, we're going to be gathering uh, on Marco Island in April for a week, and um, there are others throughout the year in Colorado and California. And um, if you'd like to find out more, again, you can go to CSETI.org, CSETI.org, or DisclosureProject.org, and uh, look forward to seeing all of you soon out under the stars. Uh, So keep looking up. God bless you all, and goodbye. Goodbye.